So the first ship and boat steering gear that we have here is the wire and pulley system, which consists of a wire or rope that is wound around the drone, which is fitted to the wheel. The wire passes through a series of pulleys on the two sides, which connect to the tiller or quadrant of the rudder mechanism. And when you turn the wheel, it turns the rudder. It's a rather straightforward and simple design, and it will be the simplest one that we have in this video. The second type of steering gear that we have is the chain and box, which actually uses automotive parts such as shafts, universal joints, and truck steering boxes. A chain comes down from the chain sprocket from the wheel, which in turn goes to a chain sprocket which has bearings on it and then the bearings are connected to universal joints and you have two to three to however many universal joints you don't have depending on the size of the ship or the boat and universal joints go to a differential which has a tiller arm on top of it and also a rod which in turn goes to another tiller arm that is connected to the rudder stock which will then turn the rudder whichever way that you need to go. The third type of steering gear that we have here is the push-pull cable, which is also called the rack and pinion system. And this is what you find commonly on outboard motors. And the rack has notches cut out in it and the pinion is simply a gear that fits into those notches and it is one of two ways as it is shown up on the diagram it is either a straight bar that has notches cut out in it for the pinion to roll on or it is curved with notches in it so that the pinion gear can then be turned via that way it's a really simple diagram it's a really simple design, but it's a tad bit more complicated than the previous two. This is your simple hydraulic steering system here. And these systems range from simple manual systems to electro-hydraulic ones. Uh, this particular system operates Utilizing the flow of hydraulic fluid under pressure to control the movement and position of the rudder, the system consists of a two-way hydraulic pump, usually an internal gear pump connected to the wheel, two pops leading from the pump to the hydraulic cylinder and ram, which in turn is connected to the tiller. The rotation of the wheel will force the oil from the pump to one side of the ram and thus rotating the rudder. One problem that is associated with the hydraulic system is air in the system. Therefore, most systems are built to be self-purging of air, but if the air is not purged, you have to bleed it out. This is a telemotor steering gear. And what happens here, a signal from the steering wheel is transmitted to the steering gear by the means of a telemotor. This not only ensures that the steering system is isolated to the steering flat, but it also means that the steering system can be used even if the wheel and connections are damaged or inoperative. There's a transmitter in the wheelhouse and a receiver in the steering foot. The movement of the wheel activates the hydraulic piston in the transmitter. The fluid displaced by the piston is used to displace a similar piston inside the receiver. This movement is used to control the main steering gear's hydraulic pump which in turn operates the steering gear and rudder. And the receiver is usually spring-loaded so that the steering wheel will easily return to the midship position. This is very similar to what Titanic had in a roundabout way. And finally, we have the electrohydraulic system. And it has the advantage that the signal from the wheelhouse to the steering flat is transmitted by electrical wires. The system uses an undirectional pump, which is less complicated and cheaper than a bidirectional. The pump supplies oil at a constant rate to a directional control valve, which is usually positioned in the steering flat. The valve consists of three positions, and depending on the position, 
it will supply oil to either side of the double acting ram. When the neutral position, the oil is locked in the ram, thus maintaining the given rudder angle. While the pump flow is circulated back to the tank, the valve is operational by solenoids controlled from the wheelhouse via the control box. As with the previous system, there is a bypass and relief valve fitted between the left and right sides of the ram. Here we have a simple hole. Now I'm going to attach a normal rudder to the stern. If we keep the rudder amidships, we can watch the flow of water around the whole rudder combination. It flows evenly, and this means there's no turning force generated, so the hull should move in a straight line. If we turn the rudder to port, we can see the effect it has on the flow of water. This type of rudder has now directed the water in a different direction. The water has been directed at an angle, away from the boat. This extra water increases the pressure exerted on this side and decreases the pressure on this side. This pressure difference pushes the stern in this direction, inducing the desired turn to port as the speed of the water increases the effectiveness of the rudder. Also increases. This is why your rudder appears more sensitive at higher speeds. But what if we change the shape of the rudder slightly? We can make it resemble, say, the wing of an aircraft. Aircraft wings, after all, do generate lift by forcing air to flow quicker across the curved top surface of the wing. This sucks the aircraft into the air and is far more efficient than just using a flat wing at an angle. If we apply this principle to a rudder, it gives us a new shape. We'll call this the aerofoil shape. Again, the rudder is amidships. There's no deflection in the water. So, the boat remains in the straight line. If we turn the rudder again, the water is going to deflect off to one side. This time, however, the shape of the rudder forces the water to run over the curved path. The water on this side now has to flow faster to flow around the rudder. The water on the other side, conversely, has to flow slightly slower. This speed variation adds to the pressure difference generated by the deflection alone that we saw before. This side is actually higher pressure than it was for the flat rudder. Likewise, this side is even lower pressure than it was before. All this means is that there, for a given speed of water, the curved airfoil shaped rudder will turn about more efficiently than the flat rudder. But what if we modify the shape of the rudder further? Still, this time we're going to add an additional flare at the end. We'll call this a fishtail or a shilling rudder. They use this type a lot on ships to improve maneuverability at slower speeds. Again, the water flows evenly around the rudder when they're amidships. This time when we turn the rudder, we can see the additional water deflection. We have the same initial deflection as we did with the board rudder. We have the slow speed differential that we did with the aerofoil, and now we have the additional deflection created by the flare at the very tail of the rudder. This reduces the wasted water flow that was previously flowing around the edge of the trailing edge, this combination acts to further increase the efficiency of the rudder. If it's more effective at the same speed, the logical deduction is that it needs less water to flow to generate the same turning force. These sort of rudders are far more effective at slow speeds, making them particularly useful for slow speed ship handling. The final type of rudder we're going to look at is an active rudder. If we go back to the airfoil shape, and this time we're going to break it near the tip, the tip can then be linked to the main body of the rudder by mechanical linkage. That forces it to turn further than the main rudder. For example, if you turn the rudder 210 degrees, the mechanical linkage will turn the tip of the rudder further 10 degrees. This applies throughout the whole range of movement of the rudder. At 35 degrees, this tip would be a 35 degrees further, which is 70 degrees from the direction of the movement. We call this type of rudder flap rudder or a Becker rudder. Becker is the name of the man and the company that developed the rudder, so it's actually, actually just a brand name, much like a Hoover, Hoover 
vacuum cleaner or a jacuzzi for a hot tub. When we look at the flow of water, the diagram for a flat rudder, we can see again that a midships is not a turning force. Generated, when we turn the rudder, we have the same change in water flow as much before. The lock shilling rudder, the flap rudder, generates that additional increase at the tip. This time, however, the increase of the tip continues to increase even further. The further you turn the rudder, when the rudder is hard over, the tip is practically directing water sideways. This makes a flat rudder one of the best options for a slow moving ship. With all the rudders that we've looked at, you've seen the water flow is needed for them to work. On a sailing boat, the boat needs to be moving for the rudder to have the effect it. On a motor boat or on ships that are powered by engines, you've got two options. Either you need to be moving through the water or the propeller needs to be turning, pushing water across the rudder. If you're trying to maneuver at slow speed, you don't want to have the engine running all the time. You're going to need to pick up speed. You can use small bursts from the engine to generate the same effect of you moving the rudder over to give a kick and hit. You're going to get the same turning effect while minimizing the buildup of speed. Another thing to think about when using rudders is that you don't want them to stall in the same way that an aircraft points up too sharply, they'll stall out. If you turn a rudder too hard over, it's going to stall. Hopefully you found this information today useful. Until next time, thank you for watching.